week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You're absurdly careless about sending out invitations. It's very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving invitations. Anyway, I can't dine at the Savoy. I owe them about £700. Oh, why on earth don't you pay them? You've got heaps of money. Yes, but Ernest hasn't. Ernest is the sort of chap that never pays a bill. Then let us dine at Willis's. You had much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. I dine there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. And I know perfectly well whom she will place me next to tonight. She will place me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. That is not very pleasant. Indeed, it is not even decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. I mean, the amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad, it's simply washing one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunburying. I want to tell you the rules. You're not a Bunburyist at all. If Gwendolen accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. In fact, I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too much interested in him. It is rather a bore, so I'm going to get rid of Ernest, and I strongly advise you do the same with Mr... With your invalid friend who has the absurd name. Nothing will induce me to part with Bunbury. And if ever you get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you will be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. <laughs> that is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she is the only girl I saw in my life that I would marry, I certainly won't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realise that in married life, three is company and two is none. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Only relatives or creditors ever ring in that Wagnerian manner. Now, if I get her out of the way for ten minutes so that you can have an opportunity for proposing to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you at Willis's tonight? Oh, I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. Now, I hate people who are not serious about meals. It's so shallow of them. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. I am feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. Uh, that's not quite the same thing. In fact, the two things rarely go together. Dear me, you are smart. I'm always smart. Am I not, Mr. Worthing? You're quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I'm not that. It would leave me no room for developments, and I intend to develop in many directions. I'm sorry if we are a little late, Algernon. I was obliged to call on dear Lady Harbury. I hadn't been there since her poor husband's death. I never saw a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. And now I'll have a cup of tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Certainly, Aunt Augusta. Gwendolyn, won't you come and sit here? Thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Good heavens! Lane, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. There were no cucumbers in the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? Uh, no, sir. Not even for ready money. That will do, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I am greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta, about there being no cucumbers. Not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I had some crumpets with Lady Harbury, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold from grief. It certainly has changed its colour. From what cause? I, of course, cannot say. Thank you. I've quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I'm going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. Such a nice woman. And so attentive to her husband. It's delightful to watch them. I am afraid, Aunt Augusta, I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you tonight, after all. I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your poor uncle would have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he is accustomed to that. It is a great bore, and I need hardly say a terrible disappointment to me. But the fact is, I've just received a telegram to say that my poor friend Bunbury is very ill again. They seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange. This Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes. Poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. Well, I must say, Algernon, I think it is high time Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he was going to live or to die. The shilly-shallying with the question is absurd, and nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy with invalids. I consider it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. I am always telling that to your poor uncle. He never seems to take any notice as far as any improvement in his ailment goes. I should be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me 
to be kind enough not to have a relapse on Saturday, for I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that will encourage conversation, particularly at the end of the season, when everyone has practically said whatever they had to say, which in most cases was probably not much. I'll speak to Bunbury, Aunt Augusta, if he is still conscious, and I think I can promise you he'll be all right by Saturday. Of course, the music is a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. But I'll run over the program I've drawn out for you, if you'll kindly come into the next room for a moment. Thank you, Algernon. It is very thoughtful of you. I'm sure the program will be delightful. After a few expurgations, French songs I cannot possibly allow. People always seem to think that they are improper and either look shocked, which is vulgar, or laugh, which is worse. But German sounds a thoroughly respectable language, and indeed I believe is so. Uh, Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Mama. Charming day, it has been, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain that they mean something else. That makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. Yes, I thought so. In fact, I am never wrong. And I would like to be allowed to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly advise you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I have often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax. Ever since I met you, I have admired you more than any girl I've ever met since I met you. Yes, I'm quite well aware of the fact. And I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. We live, as I hope you know, Mr. Worthing, in an age of ideals. Well, the fact is constantly being mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines and has reached the provincial pulpits, I am told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. Oh, there is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. From the moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. You really love me, Gwendolyn? Passionately. Darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. My own Ernest. You don't really mean to say you couldn't love me if my name wasn't Ernest. But your name is Ernest. <laughs> yes, I know it is. But supposing it was something else. You really mean to say you couldn't love me then? That is clearly a metaphysical speculation. And like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life as we know them. <laughs> to speak quite candidly, darling, I, I don't much care for the name of Ernest. I don't think the name suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a, a music of its own. It produces... vibrations. <laughs> well, really, Gwendolyn... I must say, I, I think there are lots of other much nicer names. I, I think Jack, for instance, a charming name. Jack? No, there's very little music in the name of Jack, if any at all, indeed. It does not thrill. It produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they all, without exception, were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John. And I pity any woman who is married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. The only really safe name is Ernest. Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. <laughs> we must get married at once. There is no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing? Well, surely. You know that I love you. You led me to believe, Miss Fairfax, you were not absolutely indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing has been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. But may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable opportunity. And to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, 